Okay. Welcome to uh, back to the modern simulation two, week four uh, study journey. And I hope my voice is loud enough. Right? Can you hear me clearly? Okay. So uh, first of all, I think you you guys have probably already learned uh, how to dealing with those analysis result to uh, come up with uh, some conclusion whether this structure is going to fail or not based on uh, the lecture we learned, which is offered by uh, Dr. A.J. Harish, about how to uh, test in that. And also, I hope he already also demonstrated a little bit to you guys about, uh, say, topology optimization stuff, right? So uh, let's come back to study about the multiple physics simulation. This is more about the design method, like how the uh, physics is going to be used to help your design, how to improve your design, how to somehow uh, help you to complete the coursework. Okay, so um, we're going to announce the coursework this Friday, and then there's a deadline. If my memory is correct, is uh, I think let me maybe let me jump into that page first. But I, I believe that is a very important thing. I wish that I could highlight a little bit here. All right? So here's just like we're going to have this coursework, which is going to be announced on Blackboard February 24th, I think this Friday. Okay? And the deadline is again on another Friday, I think that is two weeks later. So you have slightly more than two weeks. So probably we were about to announce the, the coursework nearly the middle of the day on this Friday, and then you have the uh, whole Friday, March 10th, to complete the, to make the submission. Why we do that? Because sometimes the Blackboard system is kind of not a very uh, reliable. So don't wait until the last minute. This is my suggestion, okay? So trying to uh, make submission as early as you can on that day. So this is something we're going to come back again later at the end of today's lecture. So today we're going to learn about the multiple physics simulation by a finite element analysis. And I'm going to give you uh, quite a few examples and to demonstrate like, how the simulation, especially those finite element analysis simulation, can be used to supervise the design and also to help you improve the design. And then, again, let's go back to memory a little bit. Why do we need the simulation? Basically, there's some multiple factors why we need the simulation, including saving the course and accelerating the design process. But I believe that uh, factor B is most of those uh, cases in many of those uh, current design practice. So without a simulation, of course, you can still make a prototype and test your prototype. But you do not have uh, a very reasonable prediction. So it turns out you are not able to predict the trend of the simulation. And then I believe that is uh, very important to help you to speed up the calculation with the help of the uh, finite analysis simulation. And not talking about the D part, and then that is about how you are able to optimize the design. And uh, a good news for you guys, like if you have a chance to take in the advanced modeling simulation in your fourth year, so pretty much you are going to see me again. I'm not sure whether it's a good news or bad news, but you're going to see me again because I'm going to teach you about those uh, topology optimization in that course, about how to optimize the design by using simulation in the loop of the calculation. How are you going to optimize that? And then that course is going to be covered by two parts. The first part is gradient-based uh, topology optimization, and the second part is more like uh, studying from the sensitivity analysis. It's, it's kind of an enhanced version about what I'm going to simply introduce uh, today. It's like sensitivity analysis, how you able to uh, find out the major factors which is going to change your design, and also how these things is able to be uh, used to supervise you getting a better design to improve your performance, okay? So, of course, if you want to do the multiple physics finite element analysis, you need to have the basic governing equations, which is going to be used in the finite element analysis to help you to derive those element stiffness matrix, right? So, in the lectures, 
because of the limited time, we are only able to introduce very simple physics, just like the truss structures. But of course, with the previous courses which you have already learned, you pretty much introduce more complicated governing equations. Okay? And from statics and dynamics and also a thermodynamics than fluid. And then all this is going to help you to derive those uh, uh, kind of element stiffness matrix. But because you have the software nowadays, so at this course level, we're not require you to derive those uh, element stiffness matrix by yourself. But if you have a chance to really do some of more advanced design problem or kind of more advanced research problem in the future, you may have a chance to really derive your own element stiffness matrix according to different physical law. So basically, one particular governing equation will derive a totally different element stiffness matrix. But of course, the final element analysis routine itself is still like you using the physics to derive the element stiffness matrix, impose boundary conditions, assemble multiple elements together to form a system, impose those boundary conditions, and then you are able to solve in those linear system. Okay. So what can be simulated? Of course, there are many things that we could be simulated. This is uh, about the mechanics, which can be simulated. And also, uh, you are able to simulate a thermal. Again, this is uh, governed by a, a portion equation. And then with the help of that, you are able to uh, compute the kind of distribution of a temperature. Okay? And then, of course, you are able to further extend it into fluid. And then if you are using a Navier-Stokes equation, so basically this uh, partial differential equation, again, can be converted into a final element analysis routine. Okay? So basically, FEA is just a routine to give you a kind of a methodology. It really depends on what is the real physics law you embedded there. And with a different physical law, you're going to have a different element stiffness matrix applied there. So this is typically what you did in the lab section. You're picking a particular element. Okay? So if you're picking 3D solid, and then that means you are generally applying the, the, the general partial differential equation there. But if you are picking a beam, beam element, so basically you greatly simplify the, uh, say, general partial differential equation to just introduce a governing equation from a beam theory. Okay? So, and then of course, about the dynamic problems, how to really simulate the dynamics problem just like uh, dropping a phone onto the ground. And then basically what you did is like you slide the time domain into very small time steps. Okay? So for every time step, you are calculating a cosine static problem. And then with the help of that, you are able to progressively calculate the dynamic changes. That is called final element together with the final difference. So it's like you're using final difference to calculating all those changes in the time domain. As with the help of the final element analysis, you're able to solve in those cosine static problems at every time current. So this is typically how the dynamic problem is basically solved in our simulation system. What else? We could simulate more complicated problems, just like uh, the CNC milling problems, how the cutting force is applied to the cutter. And also we're able to simulate like the car driving systems, whether it's a safety or not. We could apply it in a, a crash simulation. So basically, if there's a crash, what, how much damage is going to apply that to this uh, driver's neck? And all this could be simulated by a very advanced fine element analysis system. Okay? So, and then the thing is like, do we really need to consider all these factors in every problem? So again, to achieve a result much faster, or trying to improve the result by optimizing the design, you need to apply a certain level of simplification. Let's go through a very simple or very uh, 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 kind of idealized situation. Okay? Let's say if you are trying to design a car. So basically, what are the parameters you design a car? You have, a car, you have the, the height of the car, the diameters of the car, and also the thickness of the wall. Okay? So if that is the case, now we say we are trying to uh, identify a few issues. First, though, these are kind of design factors you need to consider when you start your design, is including who will use it, how will it be used. Is it just a cup for 
coffee, very hot, with a cup of full of Coke, which is very uh, uh, cold, cool. And also some other things like what is the, the, thick, the thickness of the wall you need to consider, all these materials, blah, blah. And then what we should do is like we need to think all these parts all these parameters which is going to be used in your design, and then we're able to model it, and then we apply the, the simulation. Okay? So let's look at the thing, like you need to simulate it, but at the end, you still need to verify these, all those ideas and the models by a physical test. But before that, let's look at those simulation itself. So basically what we did is like we designed something, we think, we model, we do the experiment. That is the trial and error process in your physical design. Okay? But with the help of the final item analysis, we're pretty much trying to somehow replace this from the physical experiment into the simulation. But even with the simulation, you need to be able to interpret what is the simulation result. So looking at the cup problem again. So the course is like you are going to fill your cup with very hot coffee. Okay? And then the, the result is like if the design is very cool, you don't have a very good design, you somehow burn your fingers. So what are the thing linking this to like the cause and effect in the middle? So you need to identify many of those uh, factors which is going to influence those uh, design decisions or influence the design itself. Okay? So let's look at, you need to identify many factors. The first thing is like what is uh, so special with the fueling a cup with uh, coffees. So basically you need to identify like the high temperature is the thing, right? So uh, it also have the physics included in, the, in this uh, calculations like the heat transfer. So you need to consider like now I'm not going to using 3D solid element anymore. I need to using an element which is able to calculate in the temperature. Otherwise you apply a totally different a, a totally wrong kind of physics there, right? So, and then you identify like, oh, now I'm going to see a kind of heat migrates across a temperature gradient direction. So basically, this is the thing to let you know, like, I cannot consider this a static problem. I have to consider it as a dynamic problem, or I have to consider it as a procedure problem, okay? So, and then, why you burn your fingers? So you need to identify where are you going to put your fingers. You're not, probably not going to put your finger inside of the cup, right? So you put your fingers on the top or on the surface. So basically now I identify a region where I'm going to evaluate the simulation result. So no matter how, how high the temperature inside of the cup, it's not going to burn your fingers. Only those surface on the cup is going to burn your fingers. So you need to consider those factors as well. So those are the things you need to consider. And then, then we come back to the, to the design. So basically, we are going to calculating the temperature kind of a simulation. So you now see, like, if you don't have this uh, car, the, uh, the handle, so basically, let me play this again. If you think about the temperature distribution change, all the way, of course, the, the red color represents the high temperature green or blue color uh, represent a very low temperature. And then, still work? Or out of battery? Can you hear? Can you hear the microphone? Oh, my own voice. Oh, sad. Okay. I hope my voice is loud enough. The people who see that back, can you hear me clearly? Okay, great. Cool. Oh. I will try. Okay, 20 years ago, I don't worry about too much. Now it's kind of a problem for me. So, and so that means we don't we don't need to really consider about those regions originally have a very high temperature inside. Okay, so we only need to consider about those regions have a temperature rising up from the very beginning. Okay, so and then. If you, without, if you don't have this uh, loop, the handle, probably you don't, you are not able to control, like uh, to avoid that, to burn your fingers. But with the help of this handle, it's kind of uh, 
effectively generate a good solution to that. So this shows you a very typical answer why you need a handle. So there are many of those design cases, like ask you a question, why I need to make in this design decision. You need to use FEA to provide the uh, evidence to really show like why this is the case. Okay. So with that of that, let's think uh, out of the box. If there any other solution, you could help to improve this situation, like to avoid burn the fingers. What else? Change your design. Yes. I cannot hear. Sorry. Can you? Yeah, right. So change the service, change the dynamics, right? So basically, it's going to slow down the temperature uh, migration, right? What else? You don't, don't change the parameters. Can we change the... <coughs> yes? Change the material? Change the material, right? So, I'm not sure whether you learn the course of heat transfer, but there's a... Heat transfer coefficient, which is related, is a coefficient related to materials. If you have metal material, typically the heat transfer coefficient is very high. But if you have some other material like wood, temperature kind of uh, 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 coefficient is very low, right? Heat, heat transfer coefficient is very low. What else? What else you could do? Basically, you can manipulate with the dimension, you can manipulate with the uh, new design, the handle, introduce a new topology, and then introduce a new material. And what if I don't change the material? I change the design again. What about if I generate an insulation layer in the middle? Is it possible? So this comes out another design. I, you can see many of the very high-end cup designed like this, right? So you can use, still using the same material metal. You can still use metal, but it turns out you're generating a kind of a vacuum layer in the middle to separate because there's no particle in the middle, and then there's no material in the middle, there's no heat transfer in the middle. So always try to think out of the box. Don't limit yourself to one particular design. This is something I would like to highlight here. This is somehow related to the last question of your coursework as well. Okay? If you always think the coursework along the line that we practice uh, in the previous lab sections, okay, just to change parameters, to change your material, and then probably you may not get in the extra bonus. But if you think separately, you think about like, what about if I change the topology? This is also inspired by the second part of uh, week three's lecture, so which I wish like uh, AJ already showed you. That is actually comes out from one of my supervised, uh, one of the individual projects supervised by me. It's like how you able to change the design by introducing more holes. So first I'm still keeping the mechanical property, but uh, reduce the weight, okay? So this, again, is some of the other solutions. So basically, the methodology of a design optimization is like you need to always include simulation in the loop, but trying to iteratively change, also introduce some of the random thing, okay? Some of the random factors is going to uh, introduce diversity and also going to generate the breakthrough of the design. That is always something happens in the middle. So this is a systematic way how the design could be a, a further enhanced and optimized. Okay. But the other thing I would like to introduce here is about uh, the systematic thinking. So what about if you are trying to have a very complicated system which needs to be optimized? So you need to identify among all those possible factors that's going to influence the system by identifying those major factors. Okay. So how to identify those major factors, which is very important. So let's think about the system 
can have many of those input parameters, and let's say the systems kind of link with each other. So each circle just indicate one status of those uh, system. So this is described as the state machine. And then you have a different input, you are going to have a different output. So the first thing you need to do is to identify like what are the major parameters that's going to change the, the, uh, the, the output. I'm not sure if any of you have the play with the, well, this is quite historical. You play with those a very old radio do you have any experience? There's uh, many of those buttons you can tune. So let's consider about the whole system, just like a very old radio, which have uh, multiple buttons you can tune. So each button controls one input, right? So you have, so basically, each button controls one factor. Now you are trying to identify a very good frequency. So it turns out you're able to receive the music in very high quality. So that's the output, okay? That is my target or my objective to really optimize this system. Now you need to tune these parameters, right? So when you tune one button, it may change very fast, okay? When you tune one, the other part, uh, uh, button, so basically it's going to change other aspect of the system. So you have a multiple aspect is going to change the system and have influence out to the outcome, right? So the thing is like, how are you able to identify which one is the main factors, which is the key factors you need to change? So this comes out with a very good methodology which is called sensitivity analysis. But before that, let's consider about the jumping board example, okay? Let's say like if you are trying to design a jumping board, so basically, you don't want it broken, you want it to generate enough variation, you want it to have provided enough support when a, a, a player is really jumping into the water. So this is a jumping board design problem. So you have the system which have a board, you have the system which include of also the support if the board is really installed on the wall or whatever places, okay? And then you need also have another factor that's going to influence the performance, the human being. So let's consider about what are the thing we need to ignore during the design process. What about the temperature differences is going to influence the jumping ball minor, minorly is going to really influence it, but not very significant, right? What about the humidity, the position of standing, or like a no uni uniform material distribution if using a wood? So basically you cannot control the material distributing that precisely, right? So there are many of the factors, but what is the most important factors you need to consider? Let's leave this question a little bit late, okay? So now, let's look at how are we able to formulate. Of course, the physics is a static problem, right? And the model, we need to simplify it. We don't try to using a SOLIDWORKS model which have those uh, kind of rounded edges pretty much you need to remove those rounded edges for the reasons I will tell you a little bit later today. And then you need to modify the model a little bit so it turns out more easily to be applied in finite element analysis and then you need to make a certain adjustment just like remove those affiliate, remove all those rounded edges. And then let's consider about what are the boundary conditions, so including materials, fixtures, forces, and also uh, where are those uh, component interaction happens, right? So, an analytic solution of a beam, I'm pretty sure that each of you are able to calculate it by your beam theory. The thing is like, which you're calculating with a very tedious process, and then it's just giving you, again, for those analytical solutions, only giving you an approximation. It's not, it's not as claim as an accurate solution because it's idealized many of those factors, okay? which is not true in most of the case. So, but you need to calculate a numerical solution. So I, I don't want to go into detail. Just, this is just to give you a quick uh, kind of uh, a review about if you are trying to calculate it by hand, how many uh, tedious steps you need to go through. Okay? 
So basically, this kind of a calculation, you need to using an uh, OLAS method to solving an ordinary differential equation. So basically, if you have more steps to calculating, to solving those uh, partial differential equations, uh, ordinary differential equations, you have more accurate results, right? So if you're using larger time steps, you have a more uh, uh, approximated result. So basically, if the exact solution is like giving us the red curve, uh, pretty much you have, if you're using 12 steps, you have a result which is approximate result very close to the ideal result. And then if you're using the smaller time step number, that means a large time size, larger step size, pretty much you have a much more uh, approximation error which is going to be generated here. Okay. So why this happened? This is because you are really solving a differential equation like this, all right? So this is this is beam theory, and then the thing why you why you solve here generate an approximation because if you consider about the whole system status, just like one particular particles located in a very high dimensional space, okay? So this ordinary differential equation actually gives you a kind of uh, a Gaumann equation just like how a vector field or a how a speed field is really driving the particles moved along a given trajectory. You need to trace out those trajectory to get a very accurate result. Okay, so that is the so ordinary differential equation. So basically, I'm pretty sure that you learned this before, right? I hope you learned this before. In numerical calculation courses? No? Yes, right? I guess you learned this. Milan, Milan's course, I, I hope. I'm not sure which course, but I, I guess you learned something like this before. Or no, you don't, you don't learn this before? This is just like, let me, let, me, let me explain a little bit more. It's just like, you have an ordinary differential equation. The right-hand side could be any of the particular formula. Okay, let's say it can be evaluated precisely. It's a function is going to be influenced by the, say, time. Okay, now I'm going to calculate the trajectory of the particle movement. Okay, the particle you can think about is a 2D particle. If you have a system, and then this, uh, this particle will be the system status, and it could be a particle in a very high dimensional space. So you are trying to calculate the dynamic change of the system, just like you are trying to calculate in the trajectory of a particle movement in a 2D system. Okay, this is something I guess you could understand. And so the thing is like, how I'm going to trace the system? How I'm going to trace the variation of the system? How I'm going to calculate in the trajectory of particle movement is always all the way come from a starting point that is initial status of the system, okay? Let's assume that we have a very small time step, and within this time step, the system change is constant, okay? This is typical a linear approximation, right? We approximate that the system change with a very small time step is a constant. So if we somehow come back to this, let's say now the system status is x, and then we started from time zero, and the time step is delta t. And then the first derivative of the system is already given by the right-hand side formula. Okay. Now I'm trying to calculate what is the next position of this system, or what is the next position of this particle after a very small time step delta t. So that is a typically calculated by a thing which is called Olaf method. So basically, the current status of the system, delta t times, what's this? This is the first derivative of the status, right? Okay. <coughs> so if we have this, you are able to predict what is the next status of the system after delta t time, okay? So by progressively calculating this, 
So basically, you starting from this point, moving to this point, moving to this point, moving to this point, and moving to the next point. So this is the way how you're able to progressively tracing out the system. If the system status is evaluated by FEA, okay, so you are able to calculating the dynamic change of a system by the simulation. So at every time current, you just are using simulator to help you predict the system status. Okay? So as long as you are able to calculate in the differentiation, and then you are able to trace in the system variation. Of course, if you're using a very small time step, that's what I'm showing here. So originally time step is very big because I'm approximating the system by a linear change. So I suddenly jump from this initial position to a position which already have very large error. But differently, if I'm using a very small time step, we're able to move from the here to here to here to here and here. So we're basically following another trajectory, which is more closer to the ideal solution. Further reduce the time step, and then we're able to somehow go through this trajectory, which is even closer to the real solution. So the smaller time step you have, the more accurate result you are going to achieve. But of course, there's also some drawback of using a very small time step. Let me ask you a question. If you have a number A, which is a normal number, which is a global number, let's say between 10 and minus 10, okay, so a real number. And then if I use this number to times to multiply another scale, let's say time step. Now say, just now I mentioned the first four time step is going to give you very accurate results, right? So what if this time step is very, very small number, 0.0000000000, many, many zeros until one. Okay, that means say 10 times by power by minus, let's say, 64. Okay? And then you're using this real number times this very small time step in a computer system. What will the computer do? Probably zero, right? So this idea is a called truncation error. I guess you got the answer for this one. But what if I am trying to achieve a very accurate simulation result? Now I'm using extremely small time step. What I'm going to have? It turns out the truncation error is going to dominate the whole thing, right? So you need to somehow find always find a, a trade-off. Between the accuracy what you want to achieve and also the truncation accuracy. This is a very important thing. I'm not talking about if you're using extremely forced time step, you're going to have a very extremely long calculation time. Right? So this is one point I would like to highlight here. And is there any solution to solve it? Of course, there's a solution to solve it. But that is not something I'm able to cover here today because of a time limitation. And then you don't want to really using all the method to calculating this. This is called explicit all the method. If you're using implicit method, so it's just like you predict what happens the next step and then trace the back. This is called implicit all the method, which is, can help you to picking a relatively large time step, but still achieving certain level of accuracy. Okay. So, uh, but that is not able to be covered here. So basically, although it's mentioned like bigger steps, bigger arrow, but if you change the update scheme a little bit, by inverse it a little bit, <coughs> you need to uh, using a relatively large time step, but still getting a good result. But of course, that needs to involve a linear system in the calculation process. And what about the field problem? Similar to the time domain, for the field problem, you also have another resolution you need to, be you need to consider. That is the mesh size. So similar to the time domain calculation, the smaller time step 
you probably is going to have for a better accuracy as an outcome, but for field the problem the same. If you're using a smaller element size, pretty much you have a much better kind of approximation, right? So all the FEA calculation is a kind of approximation because, for example, the beams problem or the bars problem, we kind of assume what happens in the middle between two nodes. Is there a constant change or linear change? Right? So here, field problem the same. If you're using a more dense mesh here, and coarse mesh in this domain, so basically those more dense mesh area, you are going to have a more accurate result. So that's why if you are trying to simulate a, a phenomenon just like uh, uh, the crack, okay? you're trying to simulate the crack, so basically you need to have a very, very dense mesh near the tip of the crack. Okay? So if you're trying to simulate a kind of a, a region of material which you have a large or have a, a very nonlinear performance. So you need, again, to use a very dense mesh. So here brings out a problem about what is the, the best quality of the mesh we could pick in FEA so, uh, software. So those are the things we need to consider. So basically, let's come back to the FEA solution process again. So all the way you're starting from the selection of element. When I say selection of element, that means whether you are going to use in the truss element or you are going to use the beam element, or the general 3D solid, or the shell element, or something else. Okay, so picking the element type first. And then the second step is like you need to do the meshing. Okay? So always the problems of your simulation comes from like you, you do not have a perfect mesh. Okay? So what is the perfect mesh? And then let's say how are the types of elements. So basically, besides of those physical law, and then we have another type of element we should choose. And then in your coursework, in your lab, you're pretty much only using those linear elements. So it means in 1D, you have one node and two nodes happens in the mid. And then, given on the two ends of this 1D problem, but what happens in the middle is a linear approximation. Okay? So in, in 3D, you have a tetrahedron. In 2D, you have a triangles. So basically, what happens in the middle is an interpolation function. Unfortunately, because of Milan's course is not one semester earlier, you only learn interpolation near the end of his course. So, but here, let's say if you have three nodes on the on the on the triangle, so you are pretty much is able to calculate a linear interpolation inside of this triangle based on the node value of the three corners. So, if you have a quadrangle the same, you pretty much are able to calculate a bilinear blending in the middle of the four nodes. But it's still a linear function happens in the middle. So what about I don't do that? I say I'm trying to using more nodes which is located on the edge of the boundary. So if that happens, you're able to introduce a quadratic polynomial in the middle to interpolate what happens. Okay, by using more node values, but still one element. Okay, but more node values, that means a more degree of freedom. So of course, besides of a quadratic function, you could use a cubic function as an interpolation function in the middle. So basically, more nodes introduced on the boundary, but topology-wise, it's still just one triangle. Although I, I draw a curved boundary here, but that's not means like geometric, geometrically, it's a curved region. No, geometrically it could be still a straight line, but only because you adding more node in the middle, you are able to generate a, a, a kind of more curved interpolation in the middle. Okay, so this is a, a different type of element you could apply here. But of course, this is physics. Different types, right? The the jumping ball problem you are able to use in beam elements. You are able to use in shear elements. You are able to use in solid elements. Of course, beam is calculating much faster, but which introduce a lot of uh, simplification. And shell, slightly longer, more accurate. 3D solid, very accurate, but give you a long calculation time. Okay? 
And then the other thing we need to consider about is like compared to the linear elements and the nonlinear element, usually nonlinear elements give you much better accuracy as the calculation. But you need the software to support nonlinear elements. <laughs> Some of the very basic quantum element analysis software only support the linear element. For example, those simulators which is, uh, comes together with the SOLIDWORKS, okay? Which is, that's why we need to using some of software apps instead of directly using uh, SOLIDWORKS to do the calculation. And then we are able to use the nonlinear element in the middle. Let's come back to mesh. So mesh is a very important thing and so, just now I already showed an example, like for those regions you need to have a more accurate mesh. You need to have a more dense mesh. That dense, this real density of the mesh, a real density of elements which is used in there, which is called the edge method of refinement. That means we are trying to approximate the curve. If you're using the coarse mesh, you did something like Although you don't change the interpolation, it's still flat at the top, but once you refine the mesh, that means you're using more bars, right? Similarly, in the 2D problem, that means you're using more triangles there, okay? This is called edge refinement. And the other types of refinement, which is called P refinement, is like, instead of change the number of elements, I don't change the element number but instead of that, I change the interpolation function. For example, the original interpolation function, which is shown here, is just a, like a constant function, but we're able to change the constant function into a linear function, okay? So, and then we're able to further change the linear function into a quadratic function at top. We are, we are able to further change the quadratic function into a cubic function. So basically, you are able to have a more degree of freedom introduced by the interpolation function of the elements. So this is also something you are able to pick in the FEA software, okay? So, but still, we need to have a quantitative method to evaluate the quality of mesh. So how are we able to evaluate the quality of mesh? Typically, all this shown here a possible way to evaluate the quality of your mesh, but among all these possible methods, aspect ratio and the Jacobian ratio are the most widely used method to evaluate the quality of mesh. So let's look at what is the aspect ratio and what is the Jacobian ratio. Well, good day. My name is Tony Botting. I'm a finite element specialist at Go Engineer. Today we'll be talking about aspect ratio of finite elements in a mesh. And one of the reasons is you might be asked about what's the maximum aspect ratio in your mesh. So we'll talk about what it is, uh, why do you care, and what it should be. What we're looking at here is what you could consider a coarse mesh and I've got a beam here or a component being bent and there's a stress showing up in there and you can consider this kind of a coarse mesh so the aspect ratio you can generate a plot of that if you right click on the mesh icon and choose create mesh plot there's an item labeled aspect ratio so you can plot that and you get a legend here and I'll double click the legend and show the max that's showing up about 9.2 and so what does that mean uh, I've got an element here that I developed and here's a four-sided tetrahedron and so what they're doing in the software for each and every element they're dropping a normal from a face to uh, sorry the the vertex opposite that face and you can see the black line here there's a distance of about 2.7 and that's obviously the largest dimension there the element aspect ratio I've written with a little pen tablet here or AR is the largest element dimension divided by the smallest element dimension so it's just a ratio 1.27. So we'll ratio that I'm getting a distance of about 1. I'd like to pause here a little bit. So typically it's a very good method to evaluate whether this element is more closer to the regular shape or not. <coughs> think about the triangle. So this is really, think about the 2D problem. So the minimum distance versus the maximum distance. So basically if you go to 1 and this 1, you'll have a regular triangle. If you have a needle shape, you send the needle shape, or you have a cap shape, both are very bad shape. Why is it bad? Because don't forget what you have to do here is kind of a linear interpolation function. If you have a half shape, something like this. So you typically kind of introduce large distortion of those interpolation in the middle. Okay. The master of 
collision to happen, the best thing the collision to happen is only happens in that the shape nearly similar to the regular shape. So that's why that is the that is the background reason, like why the aspect ratio is a very good way to evaluate whether the element quality is good or not or not. Okay, two seven. Let's assume that's the smallest dimension, one point two seven. So we'll ratio those two with the calculator, and I think I've already done that here, but it's two point seven over one point. 27, and that's 2.1 is the ratio, uh, or the aspect ratio of that element. So what's a good aspect ratio? Well, it turns out the aspect ratio of a perfect element is 1, meaning it would be a much more unilateral or equilateral looking uh, object here, and this is kind of stretched, stretched out. So it turns out that can be less than or equal to 5. So the perfect element, I'll just write that here. Perfect AR is approximately equal to 1.0. And what we want are 5 for structural. And some analysts like to use 3. In fact, in the software, they use 3 for kind of a limiting number. Um, it turns out that if you're doing thermal analysis, you can get away with something of about 20. And by thermal analysis, I mean temperature fields only. Temperature fields only. Because as soon as you couple a thermal analysis into a structural analysis to get the thermally induced stress or thermally induced strain, then you've got to have an aspect ratio less than about 5. So these are very important numbers. as shown by the videos, like checking your aspect ratio before you apply your simulator. Okay? Because the match quality is, uh, does not really satisfy with this response. Think about the way that whether you are going to remash it or you're going to refine those, the region have a very large aspect ratio. That's very important uh, information here. Okay, and uh... so how can you control that? Well, we'll go in here, and you do have some control over it. Here I've generated, we had the mesh quality for this one showing up, maximum was about 9, and that's not a good ratio. We want less than about 5. So I've gone to study 3, put in a mesh control in the fillet here, and we'll show the mesh quality. And we're getting a maximum of about 4.6, and it shows on the legend there. And I'll zoom in on that element. You can see it's a little bit stretched out, but it's still under uh, 5, which is probably okay. We'll look at the stress here. We see the stress goes up. It's, it's moving towards convergence as you refine the mesh more and more. So you can also get some details off the mesh icon to show in the find an element model how many elements or the percentage of elements with an aspect ratio less than about three is 99.7. So that's pretty good. I, I would like to pause here because this is uh, from SOLIDWORKS. So one task is like go back and check your answers. Similar function, but you need bigger Okay? So using the answers to check in your ratio of the mesh, and then see whether it's any way you are able to match it to improve the aspect ratio. Okay? So this is just one way to uh, evaluate the problem. That is, which is pretty much related to edge refinement. Because this is only an uh, evaluation which is uh, applied for the shape of elements, right? So what about the peer refinement? How are you able to evaluate whether the element is good enough according to the peer refinement? So pretty much you need to use in the Jacobian ratio. So the Jacobian ratio is actually, as what it, uh, what is the defining here, Jacobian ratio is really calculated in the, by the uh, Jacobian determinant. So basically, <laughs> inside of interpolation function, you need to identify the Jacobian ratio inside by the ratio of the maximum and minimum determinant value inside of this interpolation, okay? So which is more uh, mathematical calculation involved. I don't, I don't want to go into detail here, but again, go to checking answers, how you're able to output the ja Jacobian ratio of each element, and then you're able to control it. So as what is shown here, if I, again, ideally we need to have a Jacobian ratio nearly the pro uh, more 
closer to one, the better, right? But many of those cases, you need to uh, have it as long as less than 40, always is giving a reasonable, accurate result. Okay? And then the other thing I would like to highlight before I go further for the uh, other parts of the, today's lecture is like trying to defeat those models. Because if you have one model which comes out from a, a SOLIDWORKS, you pretty much have very uh, kind of uh, find the detailed geometry, like those rounded shape along the edges. But if you apply this to FEA, what happened? Well, it will generate extremely dense mesh near those regions, right? Because they are trying to capture the detailed geometry. So trying to remove all those rounded things, make it just a very flat top, very flat side. And then that's going to reduce the number of elements there. So maybe let's have a quick break, and I will go further for the other part of today's lecture. Thank you. Come on. Testing. Testing. Let's come back. Can you? OK, great. Yes. Yes, of course. Just uh, tune, just like simple. The idea was to just tune the part. And when you tune, you can see the outcome of the change. The same amount, you tune the same amount, the bigger change, the more sensitive. Yeah, right. so well, that's related to uh, your objective. So you are trying to uh, check the maximum strength. And then you, you enhance, like, you enlarge the temperature a little bit, calculate the value, and you drop the temperature a small amount. Uh, their maximum strength in different stages is going to have a large vibration. That means this more this one is more sensitive to the parameters too. So we are simply acceptable to everyone. But that is we are usually uh, using up on our hours. Which one is more sensitive? Which one is less sensitive? Any cube is more sensitive. Okay, let the step go from the area to the control of the base, so flexibility and precision is best. Why the thing I was true is like an actual shape? This is how to generate quadrangle mesh here. Quality wise, you cannot do that. Yeah, there's some limitations, but yeah. So think about if you have a branch, this is the joint. Okay, the brands can be projected. The joint have to be checked. There's no way. Because otherwise, if you're trying to make it quadrangle, of course. And then you would squeeze. So you have more elements. This is a geometry limitation. You cannot always use using quadrangle. So full quadrangle elements is hard to get. So that's why people are usually using high Of course, uh, the triangle is less accurate compared to quadrangle. So the teacher usually is less accurate than the higher side of the So we do have the back match, like the six side which is more accurate than the four side than the teacher So But unfortunately, automatically generate a full hex match is extremely hard. It's still research challenge, right? Okay. But I just intend to ask about the open book nature of ask, ask about the book nature of the course. What is this? This is, this is yeah, it's the only open book. Oh, okay. The, the body condition is related to your student ID. So everybody is going to have a different body condition. <laughs> so there's no way to cheat. They're open book. I can use the other things. Yeah. 
And so there's no way for me to cheat on my stuff. But, but I can't ask for anything. I can't, I've got everything. I've got everything. I think you could, you could, you could ask her for help on the software part. Yeah. Yeah. But not the formulation part, I think. Formulation? Yeah, because you need to calculate it something. Yeah, but we're going to keep performing right? Yeah. But if you're picking the wrong item, that's not something you could ask. So the decision might have come from the Yeah, yeah. Oh? I hope the... I hope the microphone works again. Okay, yes, it works again. Um, come on. So uh, let's come back to the to the sensitivity analysis. And that we have uh, some questions happens there uh, during the break. One question related to the sensitivity analysis, which I'm going to cover here. The other questions comes uh, related to the coursework. Okay, I will come back to this later. So basically. Let's say, let me finish this. So, after you give the appropriate machine, you still need to uh, conduct a decision like what is the solver you need to apply here. There's uh, basically two types of uh, numerical solver, okay? And again, it's kind of a suffered if I'm not sure about your new numerical calculation course progress. Have you already learned how to solve in a linear system? in that course, like linear equation system. Gaussian enumeration, have you learned that already? Okay. So is the Gaussian enumeration a direct solver or, or an iterative solver? Direct solver, someone say. So what is the difference between direct solver and the iteration-based solver? No. Oh, I, I should have. I should buy a Milan coffee to discuss a little bit more, okay? So what is the iterative solver? That means you're always starting from initial guess of the solution and progressively change it by some of the tricky rules, okay? But no matter how many iterations you have, you always have a certain level of uh, approximation error happens in the middle. Of course, the more iterations you conduct it, the more accurate result you are going to achieve. Okay, that is called iterative solver. What is a direct solver? Direct solver is just like your Gaussian elimination. But of course, Gaussian elimination is the most primary method to solving a linear system. You have much more advanced method like uh, uh, Cholosky decomposition, LU decomposition. Basically, you kind of decompose a linear system into two triangle systems and trying to get in the solution directly, right? So that is a... Uh, Again, apply to here. So basically, in finite element analysis, you need to decide which is the solver you need to apply here. Iterative solver is very good, like, is very good as those a huge system. This is because it basically have a less memory consumption of iterative solver. So when you have a linear system which have a more than million numbers of elements, or you have an FEA which have uh, more than one million elements inside. Pretty much, it's hard to directly apply those direct solver there, okay? And, but if you have a smaller scale problems, you need to achieve a higher accuracy, I would strongly encourage you to apply the direct solver. Of course, when I say the solver here, we are both dealing with those sparse numerical system. Okay, many, many zeros, okay, instead of very dense system, which is uh, the basic form of linear solver you have learned before. So we need to consider about the computer resources, we need to consider about the time, and we need to consider about the coefficients of elements inside. So if we are using a FEA to calculating an ideal material distribution, or you are trying to using FEA to calculate a system which have a two different material inside, 
like one is very very、uh, one material with very, very high stiffness, the other material with very very small stiffness. That means what? That means your element stiffness matrix, the value, absolute value, of those hard material will be very large. Absolute value of those very soft material will be very small, right? So that means in the linear system, you have many many of those coefficients with the value in the level of thousand. Let's assume, and then the other one, soft material, the value in the level of point one or point zero one level. Okay, so there have multiple scale difference there, and in those situation, you pretty much need a very accurate solver. Otherwise, the approximation is going to dominate the whole thing, and trying to they they kind of eliminate all those material region with the very soft material properties. Okay, this is very important if you are trying to complete your individual projects. I I I really met some problem like this from my students before. So they come to my office. Say, oh, professor, I using this solver. Everything is correct. The the setting, everything is correct. The only thing he made wrong is like he picking iterative solver. So it turns out the approximation error eliminates all those contributions coming from the soft material region. Okay, that gives you a very bad result. So this is very important. Trying to think about what happens, and this is also reflect. Why you guys need to learn those numerical calculation knowledge? Because that one is really lead to a system with a very bad condition number of a linear system. I'm not sure whether you learn the condition number of linear system yet or still not covered. And but that is somehow related to how likely the linear system can be reliably solved. Okay, so it's really Related to the conditional number of linear system, okay. And then when you using software, even if you are not calculating by yourself, using software, you need to always bear this in mind. Like, oh, this is going to influence the stability of the software, okay. So these are the things that、uh, I hope can be covered. And then come back to like this, the jumping board problem, and then analytical. Solution. Let's assume it's accurate, but typically that's not. Let's assume it's accurate, and then beam elements have a small arrow, shell elements bigger arrow, and then surprisingly, solid element is not the most accurate result. Why? The only reason this happens on this test. Is because the mesh density is not dense enough. Okay, so because of、uh, beam element, the element itself better capture the physics inside. But solid elements, you just using a very general element. So here gives you one example. Don't apply solid element all the time. You need to theoretically analyze like whether this this a beam problem or is a, a, a shell problem or the different problems. Okay, but of course, you can always starting from a solid element to have the first trial, but you could have a better result if you're using different elements in your simulation. Okay, so let's come back to the sensitivity analysis. This is uh, uh, corresponding to the first question uh, uh, some of you asked me during the break. Among all these factors, which is going to influence the system, how should I know which one I will keep, which one I can ignore? Okay, so this is called sensitivity analysis. Like the jumping ball problems, all these are the factors is going to change the deflection as an output. Okay, so the deflection is the objective. I would like to achieve a design which have a smaller deflection, let's assume, and then now I would try to optimize some of these factors. Trying to reduce it, okay. So this is a way to really evaluate the performance of the system. Now I'm going to tune each of these parameters. Let's say we increase the mass a little bit, and we have a one deflection, and then we drop the mass in another amount. We have another deflection. 
So then we have a two diffraction difference, difference between these two diffraction divided by the change of the mass. And that gives you the sensitivity of deflection corresponding to the mass change. Right? So we could basically do this kind of calculation for both mass with thickness, length, materials, all these parameters. We could try to tune them by calculating how sensitive. When I tune these parameters, the outcome is going to change. So that is called sensitivity analysis. Okay? Which is actually related to your calculating the gradient of each parameter. Okay? So of course, that is not really able to be evaluated analytically, but you're able to calculate it numerically by using simulation. So that is related to your final difference-based differentiation calculation, right? So that is uh, something about mathematical meaning of a sensitivity analysis, because that is directly related to approximation of this, of this, and of this. So when you tune P1, and you're calculating this. When you tune P2, you're calculating this, okay? The larger magnitude you have, that means what? The system is more sensitive to this particular parameter. Okay? So that gives you an indicator which are the parameters I should keep, which are the parameters I could remove. Okay? So let's come back to the simulation driven design optimization. We always uh, come uh, starting from like, is it satisfied? Or is it okay? And if there's an arrow, that means we need to think about can we correct the arrow? Or even if we could correct the arrow, we say, oh, this is uh, satisfactory, but I, I would like to improve. Okay, I want it more optimized. Okay, so these are always the question which is uh, used to, to driven the, the design optimization. But of course, all of these are driven by simulation. So basically, simulation itself. It's a kind of uh, iteration process, We're starting from the basic calculation, the sensitivity analysis, change the parameters, and then see how the system can be changed. So these are the choices which we need to consider for the jumping ball problem. Okay? So, and this already summarizes a little bit about the fundamental analysis course at this basic level. I have to say, this is a very, very basic level level of finite element analysis. Basically, you don't learn finite element analysis, I have to say. You only learn how to use finite element analysis, right? So what is the, the basic idea of finite element analysis? Let me summarize a little bit of the key thing I wish you keep in mind all the time. The first thing, what is the finite element analysis? Is a method which is divided the whole system problem into very, very small elements, but with a limited number. Okay, that's quite what's called finite element, right? So for every element, you are able to apply different physical law there, right? And then you assemble this element together into a huge linear system, right? And then do you still remember what are the three S of this uh, huge system? Sparse. Symmetric and singular. singular, exactly. And then how to solve it? Huh? How to solve it? How do you solve it? Yeah. When it's a singular, probably very bad condition number. You cannot solve it, right? Boundary condition, exactly. You need to impose boundary condition to convert a singular system into a long singular system. So you always met in the, even my PhD student, they always say, oh, professor, the this simulation does not converge. When you find a simulation does not converge, usually this thing happens because you don't impose appropriate or enough boundary condition. So the calculation does not converge. So when you met any of the simulation not converge, first thing you need to check did I pick in the right boundary condition? Did I impose them correctly? Okay. The second thing you need to consider is something we 
discussed here today. It's like, did I pick in the right element type? Did I apply the appropriate mesh? Did I pick in the correct sulfur? Which helped me, it is really selfish. Okay? So, this is basically the basic concept of final element analysis, what you have. Okay. When you generate a very colorful result by FEA, you need to be able to interpret what's the real meaning of this color. Don't simply say, oh, because it's a bad design because it's red, it's a good design because it's blue. Give me the physical things. Give me the physical factors. What is the meaning of red? What is the meaning of blue? Right? Blue means what? For solid mechanics problem, what means blue? Smaller deformation, right? Smaller stress, smaller strain. Because usually final element analysis using the stress strain problem, using the stress strain solution. So basically, when you have a fixed material property, smaller stress directly reflect to a smaller strain, right? Because they are kind of uh, correlated with each other by Young's modulars, portions ratio, shearing modulars. All of this are constant if you don't change the material, okay? So the other thing you need to bear in mind, like, no matter how accurate final element analysis is, simulation is simulation, okay? No forecast is accurate. So it's just an approximation, but the approximation always gives you the right trend. So that means its gradient is always accurate, or at least the direction of its gradient is accurate. So it's very good for you to evaluate whether this one is better than that one, okay? But may, it may not be good enough for you to evaluate which one is the best one, but you could compare this one with that one. Because even if its absolute value is not accurate, but it's a trend, its relative value gives you the trend of improvement of your design, which is very good, okay? So the other thing I would like to highlight is like, don't limit yourself to one particular design by keep its original structure or by keep its original diameters, okay? It is more useful to think out of the box. That's why we need to introduce the concept of a topology change. It's like drilling a new hose, adding an extra handle, and trying to remove material, generate a, a design which does not really see in the daily life, but that is driven by calculation, right? More better way or more advanced technologies using machine learning or using other more fantastic kind of calculation process to drive this change. But at this moment, at least yourself could think about, oh, what happens if I remove those regions which have uh, less sensitive to the change of the, of the outcome, but greatly helps to reduce the weight, okay? Think about the energy consumption, everything. It's all related to the material usage. The more material you could remove from your design, you have a better design. At this moment, of course, with the condition keeping the original mechanical requirements, right? So that other thing I would like to highlight here. And then I would, with the rest of the time of today, I would like to share with you some of the typical example, like how final element, final element analysis is able to be used. Okay, so this is one. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's possible to. to okay, it's. Uh, so this is one from my my research group, which is a. Uh, uh, a project uh, collaborated with Airbus. So basically, we are trying to using uh, five-axis 3D printer system, trying to enhance the mechanical strength of the uh, part. So this is already topology optimized part, but if you're applying a loading, you'll find like this shows the principal stress direction as the arrows here. So the basic idea of this project is like you need to calculate the, the curved layers. So it turns out the filament orientation, which is actually indicated where I'm going to apply continuous carbon fibers to really along those uh, principal stress direction. So if you compare, this is not applied a, a, a continuous carbon fiber yet, but if you're looking at this comparison, you'll find that like even using 
that was a PLA. So pretty much you will see like the right hand one give you an optimized uh, layout of the filament and the left one is a con conventional two and a half D 3D printing result, okay? So you see like the, the maximum breaking force can be doubled if you compare the right one and the left one. So all this are rely on a very reliable finite element analysis which is give you the principal stress direction and then we are designed those uh, uh, advanced layer that how you align filament completely along the principal stress direction, okay? So this is just one example about how FEA is able to use the to enhance. There's a model that fabricated by uh, 3D printing. And then the other two examples, or three examples I would like to highlight here is like sometimes we need to achieve a kind of a tailor-made mechanical properties. So again, this has come from a, uh, some of my research projects. And then think about the Young's modulars of material you use in robot. So basically those Young's modulars of those metal-based robot arm is much higher compared to human beings' Young's modulars. So this is not safe. If you are trying to have this robot working together with a human being, think, like, think about the exoskeletons, rehabilitation applications, wearable devices, and also those are domestic uh, applications. If you want to have uh, some robot in the kitchen room to somehow working together with you to complete those uh, fabrication or the food making process, you probably were not going to using those uh, metal based uh, rigid uh, joint robot. But instead of that, people invent a lot of those uh, soft uh, robots. Okay, so using softer material, which is uh, trying to uh, bring in those uh, compliance of soft material in the daily uh, operation. So basically this shows uh, quite a few applications about how the soft robots is really used in many of those scenarios, just like wearable devices and in those uh, quite uh, kind of unstructured environment, very narrow region. So all of this soft robot uh, brings in quite of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, advantage, okay, compared to those uh, uh, articulated robot, which you widely see from the robotics era, okay? So, and then here shows, uh, I'm not sure whether it's work or not. I hope it work, but sounds like not. So basically, this shows another example of 3D printed software robot is going to interact with human being, okay? So if you don't have a well-designed, so basically, you don't have a, a, those a soft robot which can work closely with a human being. Uh, I'm not sure what happens here. But I, I hope it works. Maybe let's uh, restart this. I think it works. Maybe we just go this directly. Site security. Building your online business? Go to Wix.com and set up your. So, this is uh, actually come from uh, one of my students' uh, graduate project. It's, it's really designed this uh, soft material based uh, software. Ja, dit is een hele bijzondere hand. Zo, so basically, uh, this is actually in the shows like a robot arm, arm spier en naast. En in de toekomst zullen we dit in protecties en andere toepassingen in de soort tegenkomen. Squeeze it, and you can feel the squeeze, and also come back to uh, give you some interaction. Okay? The thing is like, how do you design those chambers in the middle? So basically, there are totally 10 different chambers, and each of these is driven by the pressure it's a compressed air. So basically, when you apply different pressures there, and then you're able to have this uh, soft hand bending. Okay? So once you are trying to optimize this kind of design, you basically involve multiple physics, fluid dynamics, and solid mechanics. This at least. Not talking about in the future, I, 
I embedded some of those sensors on top of this kind of design, so basically you need to have electronics involved as well. So all this required a very advanced physical calculation, uh, advanced simulation level, okay? So this is just one example. And then I would go further to show the real problem of this and how this is solved by the optimization with the help of FEA. Let's watch this uh, videos one by one. So this video shows the real problem of a soft robot if you are trying to use it to grasp something. So this one actually shows, like, if you have a, a soft robot, this is not like a real human being, because the robot is so soft, so it turns out itself can twist. The finger itself can twist it. So basically, if you have the twisting happens, the grasp of object can easily escape away, right? So that's why we need a kind of a tailor-made mechanical property of the fingers, like, easy to bend, harder to twist. Okay, this is a very simple requirement. But so it turns out, if you don't have optimized design, the left and one shows you the optimized design, the white right one is the original design. So basically, when you apply the pressure, it's going to easily bend it, side out of a plan of deformation. That's to generate the twisting. So we need to have a way to really optimize this with the help of the FEA by improve the design. Okay, so there are two ways to think about improvement. The first way is like adding an extra structure at the bottom. That's what you can show here. So this is a design generated by a kind of a creative design or intuitive design, basically like, oh, what about we adding an extra uh, a structure and we test whether it's going to improve the design or not. But that's not always gives you the best performance. But although, as what I'm showing here, with the help of this, it can give you a better stiffness of the grasping behavior, okay? So here shows this extra skeleton, uh, extra uh, structure, and without this extra st structure, this reference design is very uh, weak, kind of uh, unstable, easily uh, run away. But with the help of this uh, uh, structure, I'm not sure whether you could Unfortunately, uh, the projector does not give you the number here. This shows like we're applying the same level of pressure, okay? <clears throat> so this is more stable design. And then when we apply the same pressure here, it's very tight to grasp, okay? Because it have a less auto plan deformation. <clears throat> this is another asymmetric object, which is grasped by the fingers. And again, with the help of this extra design, extra structure, is making it much better. But that is not... So, sorry about that. So, uh, and the thing is like, you cannot... Yeah, so that makes you guys very excited. So you cannot always have these extra structures because that extra structure actually have a significant influence of a grasping working space, right? You have something else in that. But what about if we want to really keep in its original design but only allow you to change those parameters? And how are you able to get in the best performance? So. Basically, uh, this is uh, from, uh, yeah, this is actually from Rembo. I think you, you probably received his email. He's the, the GTA leader of this unit. So in this design, we pretty much are using the finite element analysis to really learn a space, how we are going to optimize it. So basically, you find like the initial design with the FEA give you, uh, so basically what is shown on this color map it gives you the out of a plan displacement when you apply the same bending, okay? So, and then with the help of that, we're able to somehow optimize those parameters, the same as what I teach you today. 
doing the sensitivity analysis, only keeping those very important parameters to be optimized, and using FEA to generate a simulation space, which can expand all the possible combination of those parameters, and trying to find out the optimal design inside of those space. So here shows like how the performance can be improved with the help of the optimized design and the initial design, right? So it's more stable grasping can be realized by the optimized finger, optimized the, the actuators. And then here shows like because of those very uh, optimized design, when you apply certain level of gravity, it does not run away of those uh, 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 grasping space, graspable space, right? And then he shows the comparison of uh, other objects asymmetric, and here we're using the displacement of the objects to really demonstrate uh, how the performance can be improved. So if you're looking at this, this gives you a very good example about like uh, how simulation can be used to uh, improve your design when the design has multiple physics involved in the calculation process, okay? And I guess now is the time where we are moving to the most important part is the coursework, right? And similar as last year, this coursework, uh, again, gives you around two weeks to complete. And it is uh, individual coursework. And you say, well, how could you make it individual? Uh, the thing is like the boundary condition is something related to your student ID. Okay, so different person is going to apply different boundary condition there. And of course, <laughs> that is also quite a tricky part. If you, again, you, you, you share your, your thing with others, they can also apply their own student ID there, but I, I hope you don't do that, okay? So, so it turns out that is a kind of individual and tailor-made project. And we have three questions there. The first two somehow related to uh, uh, the calculation using MATLAB. The last one uh, based on uh, using ANSYS to do the simulation. How you're able to uh, make the change of the design to improve the simulation result. Okay, try to think out of the box. Don't limit yourself to uh, those uh, parameters and dimensions. There's uh, some of the typical suggestions like maybe you need to change the topology a little bit. Okay, not too much, but a little bit. When I say topology, like adding extra things or remove uh, uh, a generate holes or remove uh, one uh, truss or whatever thing. Okay, so um, the time. This is very important. There's a question that comes from, uh, I think, Alice, some, uh, or some of you, and to ask about when we are going to making uh, the coursework available on the Blackboard the coming Friday. I think in the middle of the day, but GTA says before one, okay? So uh, I hope at, until one you're able to have that. That means you have more than two weeks. Right, because the deadline of submission is actually the midnight. Okay, one minute before midnight. Okay, so, and uh, we should have good luck in this. It's not difficult. I have to say, it's like, if you go to lab, okay, if you are really uh, follow every steps of your lab exercise, and complete the lab sheets, everything smoothly, you should be okay, right? So, uh, any questions? I hope you enjoyed the, the process of. Uh, and thank you for what you've done for us over the last several weeks. Oh, welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I really enjoy your. I really enjoy the experience of you guys. I I I I'm happy to see you interact with me, and I I think like we probably will meet each other the coming September. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.
Bana mail attın da şimdi. Çözümün mailini. Evet. Ona bakamayabilirim ama aklıma gelen tek şey e, radyan ve derece kullanılan hareket etmek. Radyan olarak büyük bana derece çözmüşsünüzdür. E, radyan olarak bir bakın bakalım.
Já si jde. Jo. Kolaj. Ekstrasoru yerden tavsiyem soruları özet çözmeniz. Onun dışında kitaptan. Yani kitabın sonundaki soruları çözmeye çalışırsanız iyi olur. Onların şey, şey yapmanız ne bileyim, en azından böyle çözmeye çalışmanız bile o sizin aslında becerilerini çok fazla geliştiriyor. Ee, bazı soru çözümlerinde e, ileri derece matematik gerekebiliyor. Ee, onları çözmeye çalışın. Mesela daha önceki question'lar da var bizim biliyorsunuz bölüm sonlarında. Onların cevaplarını da veriyorum ben. Onların bir tanesinde mesela Newton Raps'ını falan kullanmak gerekiyor çözüm bulmak için. Ee, onun da ben de hatta cevabını verdim yine questions bölümünde. Yani o kadar çok spesifik böyle matematik sorular gelmez sınavda mesela. Ama onları çözmeye çalıştığınız zaman o proses önemli yani sizin için. Tutorial'lar zaten genellikle daha ben zor seçiyorum onları ki e, böyle bir yani zor yapan kolay daha çok rahat edebiliyor musunuz? Onun için böyle e, bir strateji bir şey aslında. Çok basit sorular çözmek istemiyorum tutorial'larda. E, bir de önceki yılların sorularını çözmeyeceğim tabii. Var onlar bizim zaten şeyimizde, klasörümüzde. Onlara da bakarsanız fayda olabilir diye tahmin ediyorum. 5 dakika konuşur. Hi guys, how are you? Ready for today's lecture? Coffee house? Coffee house? Yeah. So, what we are going to talk about today? Have you checked our lecture notes? No. So they are available a week or before right? on Blackboard, so you can check what is available and what you did. Good. So we, are, we will be talking about 2D or 2 degree of freedom systems. Hi guys. Here, how are you? Yeah, hello. Ready for 2 degree of freedom systems? Perfect. Perfect. Good. Have you checked our... Okay. Okay. And please try to fill the survey. So, to uh, work out. Okay. Honestly, did you find the previous uh, tutorial session helpful? Was it helpful? Okay. Uh, if you if you believe that you no, know, it could be improved somehow. So, if you have some feedback, uh, please let me know as well. So. For tutorial. Yeah, uh, for feedback there is not, but we have discussion board, right? For in discussion board you can mention uh, the parts or when about the possible improvement. Hi, Nara. Thank you. Hi guys. Ready for today's lecture? Not ready. So how many hours did you have today before? Nine? From nine non-stop or? <laughs> Perfect programming, isn't it? Perfect timetable. <laughs> I hope it will be improved, but bright side, tomorrow we are free. <laughs> Thank you.